Hi, and welcome to Found Live. I'm your host, Darren Etherington. I'm joined by the robust and very sophisticated news site to my 1990s blog. <laughs> Jordan Crook, very robust over here. That's uh, right. Thank you to everyone for joining us this week. Found is TechCrunch's podcast, where Daryl and I talk to founders about the stories behind the startups. We do it live on Thursdays, every other Thursday. And then when it's not us, it's our sister podcast, Equity. So tune in next Thursday to check out Equity. And then us, the Thursday after that, at Infinitum. That's right. And uh, another note, just before we get going, if you're coming to us on Twitter or YouTube, you can still come and join the event live on Hopin, which is our interactive event platform. And then you get a chance to ask questions uh, and we may ask those of Matt if they're good questions. So those, um, that's free. That's free to register, but you just have to go into the hop in link and that's pinned to the top of our found and tech crunch Twitter accounts. If you're on the spaces there. Uh, okay. Jordan. Yeah. You kind of people? blew, blew the intro. <laughs> I guess I, blew like the I was a building <laughs> up to it. It's not really, we're very excited today to have our guests on the show. We're joined by Matt Mullenwig from WordPress and automatic. The script says banter. So what's up, Matt? <laughs> uh, I'm really glad to be here. You know, TechCrunch has covered WordPress basically since the beginning, because it started on WordPress back when That's it was right. just my like on um, like a WordPress, the free WordPress.com account. So it's been yep. really cool over the years. We've both grown up a lot. And well, um, speak for yourself. <laughs> no, I think we're all right. We're okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said earlier, like I'm actually a little under the weather right now. So you might get a, a few extra feverish, honest answers <laughs> than normal. Excellent. That's what we it love is to hear. Kind of wild, Matt, because I feel like of all of the platforms out there in the world, like all the tech that I've ever used. I actually think WordPress might be the tech that I've used the most. I mean, for a third, think about it, Daryl, for yes. a third of my life, at least five days a week, mostly like should be eight hours a day, sometimes six, five, whatever, depending on my inspiration. I've been on WordPress. It's kind of wild. Yeah. It's like just clicked for me. If I think about like time spent in the CMS, it is amazing. And also... Matt, you mentioned you know TechCrunch is on WordPress, but it, it's far from the only publication that that claims that. And also, the, the one I started out on it was uh, GigaOM, which uh, you know Ohm very well, right? And uh, yeah, then you know every one that I've been on since, in between that too, like from there to BetaKit, which is a, a Canadian you know startup publication. Similar Stop reading to, your to resume, bro. <laughs> I'm just saying, from the beginning of my working life, I've been on on WordPress, and I bet a lot of people in the industry can say that. Um, that you know, I you came from a media start yourself, kind of. Well, you came, you built it. Let, I don't want to explain this. You should. Why explain don't you this. let him take it away? Yeah, <laughs> that's the point of this podcast. <laughs> I'll for you to tell the story. You're probably better. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. Very, very beginning, WordPress was just for blogging, and blogging was very simple at the time. It had no plugins, no themes. To to modify it, you'd have to like open the code and like copy and paste code into certain lines. So it was very, very basic. But um, yeah, I got a job offer from CNET. So I dropped out of school in Houston, moved out to San Francisco. I worked for CNET. And for people who don't know what CNET is anymore, it was like a, kind of the original internet media company. You know, yeah. they had like download.com, news.com, GameSpot, like a lot of, they actually created what I think was the first CMS because they were the first to really have enough content that you had to manage it. And um, they were early WordPress adopters. So they were early to use it. Some forward looking people there, like uh, Mike Tatum and the CEOs, Shelby Bonney, like recruited me to go work for them and kind of built some stuff for them and then helped them out with WordPress. Funny story is actually David Karp, who had later found Tumblr, yeah. worked with CNET at the same time. Wow. Oh my goodness. And then full circle, you acquired Tumblr in, when, what are we, 2019 or? Yeah, 2019. So wow. kind of full circle all the way. Yeah. And another, another nice tie in for us, because you acquired it from our benevolent corporate overlords, uh, Yahoo. <laughs> Who we I love have, very much. 
<laughs> before anything was announced, I remember did kind of like an all hands with the Tumblr team mm -hmm. where I went in and like spoke to them and said, like answered some Q&A and talked about it. And I remember looking over and there were some like TechCrunch writers at a desk, like, <laughs> <laughs> like at the other end of the, the kind of Q&A area. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, they must be really good about not listening or just like yeah. not revealing the proprietary stuff they're about to hear about the acquisition and the price and everything. <laughs> yeah, or you know, just not very good at our job. <laughs> One of the two. But I remember that. Yeah, because you share space. I think it was in the San Francisco office. Uh, they shared a floor at the time. Whenever this was. York, but... yeah. Oh, New York. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very cool. Very. I mean, but it's interesting path because you you were working on WordPress. You created WordPress, but it wasn't. It was as an open source initiative first, right? And then, because um, I think a lot of people, and we kind of simplified it at the end by saying, you know, founder of, of Automatic and WordPress, but you were working on WordPress as this open source project and it didn't become the, the monetize the WordPress.com product until much later. And you didn't create Automatic until much later, right? It was about two years later. Yeah. So one year of doing WordPress, it got like a few users, a little bit of adoption. Um, and I took the job at CNET after moving to San Francisco, uh, you know, WordPress really started to take off and it started to attract a lot of interest from investors. Mm. And um, so I was very lucky that, you know, I was able to partner with some good ones, uh, like Phil Black, later become True Ventures, Tony Conrad, Tony Schneider, um, journalists like Ohm, who really helped, uh, he, he was never an investor, but like, just because a journalist know what's really going on, he was able to steer me towards the better people in the Valley nice. and, um, El Malik where he used to work. Yeah. Uh, so that was really, really helpful. But when the company started, basically the ambition was like, could me and a few other folks get paid for doing this open source work, <laughs> like that was a, a measure of the best. Could we pay ourselves a salary? Hmm. And, um, you know, I think we raised a million dollars on a $3 million pre or something or $4 million pre. So it was like definitely a very different time. Yeah. In terms of like, and that was called an A round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm right. going to stop doing my old man shtick now. Yeah. Cause I mean, no, but we, we would now be like, well, I guess that's your pre-seed or whatever. Right. Like that. <laughs> we had to invent it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean that, for me, that is, it's such an interesting time, you know, to be operating, especially in that space, like at the kind of like the beginning of sort of internet publishing, right? Like there was other stuff out there, like blogger was, was around. Right. And there were other, and like you said, a lot of people were still right in the code, like doing it sort of manually, um, directly in the HTML or whatever, but mm -hmm. I, like I our, big, our big thesis was that. There was some proprietary software like Blogger, Removal Type, Live Journal, et cetera. And there was some open source stuff. Hmm. But our kind of idea was like if we took like a nonprofit and a for profit and were able to set them up in, in a virtuous cycle hmm. where they would benefit, that working together, they could create something far better and bigger than either a purely open source or purely proprietary software could create on its own. Right. You know, if we can get the best of like, the usability, the commercial support, the everything from a for-profit and then like the community and the kind of like open source is, is good at becoming, oh, I'm so sorry. That's funny. That's own calling. <laughs> <laughs> is it actually? Yeah. <laughs> He's a VIP, so we got through. That's um, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> speak of the devil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could find that open source and for-profit that a virtuous cycle that'll it'll just like create something that could become an internet platform. Yeah. So not unlike, uh, you know, Chrome has or Android has. And um, yeah, we're about 40% of the way so far. So about 40% of the top websites in the world from WordPress. And I think we have a path to getting to like 80 or 85%. Wow. Not unlike Android on handsets or the Chromium engine for browsers. Because um, the cool thing about open source is like, when proprietary stuff becomes more successful, it usually becomes more divorced from the wants and needs of its users, mm -hmm. right? right? Like it sort of like gets that evil monopoly stuff or, or the commercial interest or the embedded growth objectives like start to diverge from its community. But when open source gets more and more successful, it kind of becomes even more distributed, more mm -hmm. like representative of its community because it has such a wider base of developers, of contributors. You know, when we do a major release of WordPress, like 6.0, which came out a few weeks ago, um, ninety percent of the contributors aren't employed by my company, Automatic. Right. You know, they work for other companies. 
They might work for TechCrunch. They might yeah. work for New York Times. They might be volunteers from wherever. And that really keeps it honest. It keeps it aligned with the wants and needs of the community. And also just make sure that like, it's a nice check and ba balance on both my power and the power of automatic. <laughs> because yeah. if we ever went like the wrong direction, it, it would very quickly be forked and people would uh, make their own thing. Right. So, okay. So that was where I was going to get to is like, how do you keep that incentive structure? Because, you know, you've seen other companies, um, you know, initially start out, like you're saying, like voice of customer is very important. And then later on, it's like, okay, but like our path to best revenue is maybe this way and we're just going to go that way. So is that check and balance? Like, oh, at, at any time the community can say like, well, now you've diverged with our interests so we can take this away and do our own thing. 100%. Hmm. And there have been forks of WordPress over the years. Not usually for commercial reasons, usually for like product philosophy reasons. Mm -hmm. um, like they didn't like the new Gutenberg editor or something like that. So people made a fork. But uh, by and large, I think we've been able to navigate that tension. I think it's really nice to have those checks and balances on power for technology companies because technology is so naturally you get these like really, really massive competitive network advantages. Yeah. So it's nice to have a check on that uh, power. And, um, but it's never really felt like a conflict to me because for me, it's just been more about like, how do we balance the short term versus the long term? Mm, okay. So, like, I definitely think there were short term things that automatic could have done to make more money, um, uh, at any point over our history, mm -hmm. but it would have long term probably take an auction out of the room for the community. WordPress would be a lot smaller. Maybe we wouldn't have as good employees or there's lots of reasons why it would, probably we would have made a lot less over the long term. Mm -hmm. But when we start to think over five, 10 year periods, if we really project out like, okay, if we create a marketplace, how should we structure that? What do we want the long term economic incentives to be? How do we want the community to work? What percentage of the revenue in the community do we want to target to make? Should mm -hmm. it be 50%? Should it be 5%? Um, if we think long term, you get a good slice of a maybe infinitely bigger pie. And uh, I always felt like that's been very aligned. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think like it's one of your uh, lone exception, I would say, like in the general. Generationally, right? Like, right. Because it feels like there's a new crop of founders around now who have learned a lot from the group that came before about that long-term balance, right? And like the awareness of how something with really good intentions can kind of be twisted into something super messy. And there's a very like conscious kind of focus on this double bottom line. And that's like kind of outlier for your crop of founders. Like when mm -hmm. you, you know, like when WordPress was launched was around the same time that people were really blind to what things would be, what this would mean extrapolated out to Tam 10 years from now, right? right? Yeah, you had a lot of enthusiasm, but you had no long-term view, whereas it seems like all along you've thought about moderation as a key ingredient, like moderation meaning, you know, not going extreme, not actually community moderation, which is separate. <laughs> we can talk about that it's too. It's a whole other thing, but Man, like, can of worms, right? Yeah, but it, that seems to be something that, that you've had by design from the beginning, and it doesn't seem like something a lot of your peers probably had at the same time. But to Jordan's point, do you see it now as a, a key ingredient that people are building into businesses in the technology industry? I think it's important to have the aspiration. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say most founders I meet with, especially in the beginning, have the, the right intention and philosophy. But you kind of need to pair that with something almost like a bill of rights for the users. Mm -hmm. And open source, particularly the open source licenses, I think are the best version of that we've found so far in technology. It's why that even more than WordPress, I plan to work on open source the rest of my life and really okay. try to propagate as much open source on the web. Mm -hmm. um, that is, if you look at the GPL, it's effectively like the bill of rights for the users of the software. It actually okay. restricts the developer's freedom to give more freedom to the end users saying like freedom to use the software for any purpose, freedom to modify it, freedom to see how it works and freedom to distribute those modifications. Those four things when combined, um, you know, provide a uh, sort of a backstop mm -hmm. <laughs> enforcement of the uh, aspirations that we've all started with. And it keeps you honest. Even yeah. if like, let's say, I would always try to plan for the day 
like, of course, everyone considers themselves benevolent. I consider myself benevolent, but let's plan for the day that I'm not running WordPress anymore right. because I hope it outlives me. So, and let me actually assume that someone malevolent, 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 malevolent. <laughs> that's what you're going for. I was like, yeah, <laughs> that word, uh, gotcha. is running the how, even if someone with bad intentions was running it, would there be a check and balance on um, between the community and the leadership to make sure that the economic or selfish interest of the leadership would actually be aligned with the long-term interest of the community? Wow. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's like building a, I mean, it's building a system of government, right? It's the same way that you would, if you're thinking to establish, you, I mean, you made the comparison to Bill of Rights, right? It's like sort of the intention behind that entire enterprise. Now, I don't know how well that's worked out. I'm Canadian, so I can make any criticisms <laughs> I want about your country. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> I, I think, it's, and so like, you know, what's the equivalent in your business of the three branches of government? Right. Um, what is allowed in technology that's hard to do in like government, like, um, like uh, basically uh, succession in software is just copying and pasting the code. Mm -hmm. uh, so a bloodless revolution is very, very easy or a coup. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Running, like, I love crushing a metaphor down into tiny powder pieces. This so is let's wonderful. keep going. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really do love it. Like that wasn't sarcastic. I do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, we do have a question here from, oh, our old friend Drew Olenoff, uh, yeah. Jordan, and yeah, uh, you probably know Drew as well. Uh, he asks, did micro uh, did microblogging and the early rise of Twitter concern you at all? And how did it change the trajectory of the business and product, if at all? Hmm. Interesting in the context of their Twitter longer product launch that they've just done, whatever it's called, Twitter notes, right? But, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's funny. So I actually was far more focused and actually the best competitor we've ever had has always been Tumblr. Hmm. Now what's happened is that in the past 10 years, like every other social network has copied the best features of Tumblr. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the tagging, the multiple multimedia format types, everything like that. Even Twitter, you know, doubled its character length and a lot of media being embedded and then just yesterday, right? Launch notes. So um, I think the key thing that we need to figure out if we, uh, as we want a more open internet is distribution. Mm. So that's part of why we acquired Tumblr. Right. Um, part of why we're open sourcing it, putting the back end on WordPress, making the algorithms open source. Like we're, we're really taking it in a direction of being very transparent and very open at scale, which, mm -hmm. you know, they, there are open source social networks, but they've always been, you know, pretty small. Uh, Tumblr is one tenth the size of Twitter today. Mm -hmm. It's growing, so I think it could actually get to a pretty good chunk of that. And um, and yeah, serve as a great on ramp, easy social on ramp to the open web. But right now, if you're a WordPress user, you're basically getting your distribution from someplace else, from yeah. Facebook, from Twitter, from Maybe email, use, email mailing list would be the closest thing to like really owning your distribution. But uh, even then you're kind of at the mercy of Gmail and other people filtering you. So uh, I really want to get to a point where the means of distribution is in the hands of the people mm. <laughs> because we're in the hands of primarily social media companies who are driven by advertising, which I believe are economically long-term misaligned with uh, publishers. Yeah, and absolutely. even if they sort of seduce them in in the little bit, they'll, you know, the original rug pull was not in crypto. It was from companies like Facebook and Twitter. They yes. said, come build a business on us. We're a platform. And then like kind of changed their minds uh, and then, you know, literally would crush companies um, by changing their API, or removing access or something like that when they started to get too successful or when they decided that they wanted that money instead. Yeah. Yeah, and we felt that many times over the years because so, there's been many rug pulls, right? But the, the Facebook one was significant. There was the investment in video. That one we felt very keenly in terms of like internally how the, the team was, um, you know, felt invested structured. in. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then reinvested or changed once that like went away, right? So it, it would they be a massive change. A misreporting. Wasn't there a mistake in the stats as well? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. They were they were totally for years, like just reporting erroneously what they were, and then we were kind of like passing those 
erroneous reports on to advertisers. So it was all built on that, right? The, By the way, I believe that was a mistake. I think that was a bug that wasn't. Oh, I don't think it was intentional. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. But it's still, <laughs> it's, it's everyone's thing... like, are they listening? <laughs> No, we think it was totally. Was that, like, it's cool. Don't come to my house. But no, the uh, <laughs> the the but the but it comes to the point where you're talking about it, like it doesn't matter if there's malice or if there is intent, right? It's like about building in checks and balances so that when these things are happen, they're caught by the community quickly and then like corrected ideally because it's like built into the the fundamental structure of how you build the product, right? Oh, um, okay. Yeah, to tie it back. It's, but. It seems pretty. <laughs> it seems pretty obvious, but like. Matt, what's your take on what's going on with Web3 and like how is automatic thinking about that? Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. I, I was just telling someone the other day, like the if there's a bright side to the crypto crash, at least for me, it's that I don't get asked our Web3 strategy every <laughs> Oh, sorry to ruin that fun for you. I went like two weeks without being asked it. But, uh... Okay, good. Enjoy that. I'm glad for you. What I'll say I'm what I also the least suspecting person to like crash that party, but here I am doing it. So, uh, I think what I love about at least the stated principles of a lot of these things is, you know, a lot of uh, crypto projects and Web three stuff is open source, mm. uh, which is beautiful. You know, Bitcoin is open source, Ethereum is open source. People forget these are actually open source projects, just like WordPress is, which is pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, Many are not, by the way, <laughs> but, right. but you know, uh, those are uh, are. Uh, what I think has been challenging, at least as like we've experimented with it and others, is just getting like mass adoption of these things. Yeah. You know, I I don't really believe in the versioning of this, like Web two, Web three. But if you think of the companies that were sort of seen as Web two companies, uh, including Flickr, WordPress, um, Twitter, you know, those they were always pretty broadly adoptable, like mm -hmm. without too much technical ability, really, they were sort of making things easier to use. And so increasing the, um, the adoption. Um, I have found through my career, because I'm a little bit of a philosophical zealot, to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah. I'm like, a, maybe closer philosophically to like a, a Richard Stallman. <laughs> but I, I think you need, you know, they say in a revolution, you need a Malcolm and a Martin, right? So I think that when I've tried to get very open technologies adopted, but they weren't actually easier to use. I failed every time. Mm. And I see some of Web3 run into the same thing, where it maybe is like philosophically more pure mm -hmm. or gives more adoption, but requires, you know, managing your wallet is hard, or maybe it's easy to lose things, or it's easy to get fished, or much in the same way that like with WordPress, it's designed so you can run it anywhere. You can mm -hmm. run it yourself on your own server. You can run it on Raspberry Pi. You can run it on Bluehost. You can run it with us. You can run it on AWS. You can run it anywhere. But for most people, running it yourself is not recommended just because there's a technical burden to doing so. You need to yeah. make sure not just your WordPress is up to date, but all of the underlying server software for it to be truly secure. Um, so there's, a, there's kind of a technical burden. And I think it's the same thing with like managing your own keys. <laughs> like I love it philosophically. But I do wonder whether we yet, let, yet have the sort of um, like operating systems and web infrastructure to allow people to do that in a fully distributed, secure way that's also really usable. And it's, it's basic prosaic things like, what do you do when someone loses their password? How do you mm -hmm. do account recovery? What do you do when someone passes away? You know? Right. Um, so you kind of want some humans in this, involved in this process at different points. For the same way, like our legal code in the US is not code that's executed. Right. And that's a good thing because sometimes you might want a human, a judge or jury to interpret it in a way that allows for recognition of the common sense of a situation versus a just blind administration of something that was written years or sometimes hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting you bring that we up. We came back like, to the government too. Did we you did see come how back to the government. I, go. I, I like that. But I also like that you're. I think there's something that when I whenever I talk to people about the value of sort of Web3 or blockchain or any of that, it, it, they're, the main point they get is like, look, we can reduce cost immensely by eliminating middlemen, right, is essentially the, the way that they're talking about it. But that ignores something you brought up, which I don't see discussed very often, which is like middlemen have an immense amount of value, value in a lot of processes, right? Like, 
interpreters, people who do the synthesis. They're not they're not just there to ha take one thing from one end and pass it to the other, right? Like the, and then extract value. That's the that's the nefarious characterization of them, right? I'm just here to pass the potato to the next guy, and then I take a big chunk of the potato as it goes on, right? But that's not actually what's happening. They're coming to you, and it's like this potato. Uh, I don't, oh, actually, it's quite complicated. Like you own the creative rights to the potato, and you own the the whatever. This is the metaphor is terrible now. Speaking of crushing metaphors, Jordan, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about anymore. But you mashed it. <laughs> I definitely mashed it. Yeah, but it it it's like a point that is lost when you're trying. When, but I see it's like you're talking about. Like they're looking for that purity, right? And the purity has an appeal in like the basic concept or the precept that it that it originates from. But then like. It's lost entirely if you have no sense of like flexibility upon how that's actually executed, right? But, yeah. I think that's, and this is where I think the role of actually governments and regulators can be really viable because sometimes middlemen um, do become rent seeking and really For don't sure. have the value they're capturing. Um, but I think over time, assuming a functioning political system, like that sorts itself out. Yeah. And if you look at like payments, are pretty good, you know, call it 2.9%. As we've gotten into WooCommerce and e-commerce, which, you know, WooCommerce did 31 billion of um, GMV last year. Mm. I've become very intimately familiar with like the whole payments and financial infrastructure mm -hmm. that supports online commerce. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there, including around protecting fraud, yeah. getting your money back if your uh, information gets stolen, chargebacks and the resolution there and balancing the needs of the merchant with the needs of consumers. Um, and, you know, even at 2.9%, which is pretty easy for most businesses to support, um, there's downward pressure there as well. And mm -hmm. if you look at UPI in India or other sort of newer payment systems, I could see that coming down. But, you know, it's probably never completely zero because mm -hmm. there is value to be created in the middle there and some reward for, for giving that value. Not unlike there's gas fees and things in Ethereum, like they recognize as well that there's there's middlemen there, effectively, yeah. the validator. So I think that, um, but having that that middle have some flexibility, I think is a feature. And also I think having governance being able to evolve over time is also a feature. Yeah. And we've seen some of this with, oh, even the DAO vote the other day, that was like the whale that was li liquidating, I forget on which network it was, but like they, they themselves have seen some of the flexibility uh, needed in unusual situations or crisis situations. Right. Yes. Yeah. And they, uh, they've shown willingness to step in and kind of like modulate the original principle when it needed. Right. So I think, I think it's evolving, but I think you're right in that the distinction as that evolution happens becomes blurrier than like the web two, web three thing is like, well, I mean, maybe some of the underlying inter infrastructure is different, but not necessarily. It's not a generational step change from one thing to the next. Right. You still need it at the end of the day to be easier. Yeah. Like it yes. Has to be easier. To use it has to be easier. Yeah. So I think maybe we can all agree that like check cashing companies are exploitive and bad, right? right? They're exploiting, charging usurious rates to the sort of most financially vulnerable members of at least uh, in the United States society. But if you were to compare like how much crypto has helped that community versus maybe Cash App with Square, right? Like Cash App and and others like that, Venmo, et cetera, have done a lot more to like bank the unbanks yeah. than getting those folks Coinbase wallets or whatever else would be the equivalent. Yeah, yeah. I do want to get back to something you said about Tumblr, though, and being like, so it's, it's a vision for Tumblr eventually that Tumblr is sort of the combination of like a, a, a Twitter and a WordPress in some ways, or somehow it can unify the two so that you're directly broadcasting to your audience, but also it's the plat the content platform. Totally, 100%. Okay, great. I, I'm very excited about that because I'm tired of being beholden to different channels as well, right? And they're vagaries, so. I'll say that as someone who also loves Twitter. Like, I'm a little yeah. bit hooked oh. on Twitter. Like, yeah. after a lot of far. Um, I, I, uh, I just want there to be an open alternative, you know? Like, I want you to be able to choose your algorithm. I want you, I want the defaults to be a lot more about, we're trying to make Tumblr really a space for art and artists. Mm -hmm. So it's where you can go. I want to be a social network that people visit and feel better when they leave. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you're not doom scrolling. You're like choice scro scrolling. Yeah. And I'll say anecdotally, there's a lot of evidence that that's how people feel about it uh, already, at, at, at least maybe, but maybe more in a nostalgic way. So I think that's the work to be done is like a lot of people, at least on our staff, have 
very fond memories of like of growing up on Tumblr and being like you know a young adult on Tumblr and just like enjoying the community and everything there. But it's always kind of a fondness for the past. So maybe that's the ingredient there that that needs wow. fixing. Uh, I'll tell you the wildest stat about Tumblr is yeah. none of us are in the primary demographic. Oh, uh, well, maybe that's we just aged out of it. It's probably the real problem, right? Well, Sixty percent of Tumblr users are under twenty-five. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's actually, Today? I thought it was well before we bought it. That was like nostalgic people who used to use it who stayed on. Turns out we all left. <laughs> the older people all left, and like the new kids basically got on because it was some place where their parents weren't, or they could try on different identities, or be anonymous, or connect more with like art and be weird. Yeah. Versus, like the more like uh, cookie cutter social networks. They really try to keep you in a very narrow path so they can better monetize you basically. Yeah. Well, that makes me just more sad about me. <laughs> yeah. I grew yeah. into old, old guy Twitter. <laughs> this is where I belong. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, have you ever like wanted to do something new, Matt? Like not that WordPress isn't always changing and innovating, but like, you know, there are a lot of founders get something going and they get to this like huge growth stage and you have such a massive share of the market. Like, do you ever want to go back to zero and start something new or is that not really of interest or top of mind? Well, I consider myself really lucky that the structure of automatic, which is, you know, the CEO of and the funding and everything for it has allowed us to expand to a lot of new areas. Mm -hmm. So I can, you know, go into e-commerce and yeah. try to create an open source Shopify, which we've done with WooCommerce. Or actually since February, I've been CEO of Tumblr and kind of very hands-on with that product, kind of finishing the turnaround that we um, started when we acquired it. Uh, we have a podcasting app in Pocket Cast, which is really fun. Mm -hmm. We have the number one journaling app, which is sort of private encrypted blogging in uh, day one, which you know is one app of the year awards from Apple. Like there's, there's so much in there. So both through acquisitions and through launching new things, we tried to design automatic kind of like a digital Berkshire Hathaway mm. where we can acquire things, we can invest in things. You know, we've invested 30, $40 million in other companies. Like we have a lot of flexibility in how we operate towards our mission of um, creating more open and free and democratic internet. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can do that by partnering, <laughs> building, buying, creating from scratch, um, growing something like we, we have almost infinite flexibility, um, f in our corporate structure and our, uh, LP base, our investor base, basically to do so. Nice. Yeah. And, and you mentioned like the different, when you were talking about all those product characters, it's just like, you're tackling different aspects of the, your online life, right? You're doing your, your public life, your sort of like shared persona, your broadcast persona in the, your purchasing life, your consumer, your life as a consumer on the web with the e-commerce and your private life with the diary. Is that kind of how you think about the, the approach to what products you enter into next or what categories or how, how do you make those decisions? See the fundamental driver of our decision-making is very much, um, can it complement our operating system layer because mm. WordPress is really like an open operating system for the web. And so um, is a product that we're moving into complementary. Uh, and some of that might not be obvious. Like day one, I think is highly complementary to an open web because you also need a space for your private thoughts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it's truly private, like let's say you're um, a therapist taking notes on your patient or, you know, bribing or uh, a diary that you were keeping. Yeah, don't put that on the web. Right. Uh, keep it fully encrypted. Day one has basically the same encryption as as one password or other password mm -hmm. manager. So that's like a truly secure place. I can tell you, yeah, put the stuff that's really important in private. It'll synchronize, but even on the servers, there's no way we could ever access it or decrypt the data. So like from a very technical level, does the architecture of the product support the end user goals of it? And I think that's just really important. So uh, to me, there's a, a path there, you know, like publishing is great, but also people want to make money from that. So like, how do we enable that? And WooCommerce supports subscriptions, memberships, selling physical goods, selling digital goods, renting things like this. It's kind of, cause it's open source. It's kind of supports the whole range of economic activity. And then what does that enable? You know, WooCommerce is kind of where WordPress was in 2008. Mm -hmm. It's really a developer first tool that, you know, we're now trying to make more easier or trying to make easier to use. 
Um, what does that look like 10 years from now when maybe it's doing 500 billion or more of GMV through it? And there's now this economic layer can be open sourced and give people freedom of choice as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so I think the other question that we wanted to ask that uh, uh, definitely is something right up our alley for all of our founder communities, but you are a very rare exception. Like we always ask about your growth as a leader. You have maybe the longest like unbroken chain of <laughs> leadership responsibilities that at a single company that you are involved in as founder. So like what, how has that been for you? How has been your growth? I know you, you've talked about being a very consistent when it comes to, you know, your fundamental beliefs around mission, I think, but, but what about as, you know, a leader of people like, as a man? Yeah. The soft skills. Yeah. Of the people around you. That's a good question. Um, you know, again, it started when I was 19. <laughs> so yeah. I, say, I, I feel like I was really lucky that I connected with people like that I mentioned earlier, like Omalik, to really help me through those early years. Cause that was really, I was not good at a lot of these things. <laughs> but, you know, we, we built a team. It's really been all about the team from the very beginning. You know, I had a co-founder with WordPress. Uh, Tony Schneider joined very early as the CEO of Automatic. Like building that team to, compensate for really my weaknesses and my inexperience. Um, and what's cool is that we're, we're still working together. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Nice. we've learned and grown together. Um, you know, automatic has an incredibly high retention rate. So our regretted churn is only like 6%. Um, so people tend to stay at the company for a long time, which means that sort of learning and development is doubly important because if people are staying, the world is changing really rapidly. How do we make sure that, um, our leaders, our, even our individual contributors are like growing to keep up with the latest technology. There was a point when you know, the future of WordPress was clearly JavaScript and we had, you know, a hundred of the best PHP developers in the world, but none of us were very good at JavaScript. So we all had to like go back to the beginner's mind and like learn this new language and new way of developing and new everything to keep WordPress relevant for the next decade. Um, and we did that. So how I think about that for myself is how can I increase my self-awareness? How am I getting really raw, candid, and honest feedback from those around me? Mm. Um, how am I surrounded by those that uh, both have complementary skills and the ability to call me out when I'm wrong, which mm -hmm. happens all the time? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then just what's the iteration cycle? You know, mm. how are we? Because it doesn't even matter what you're doing internally. Ultimately, the the ultimate boss is your. Uh, your customers, your yeah. community. So how are we publishing yeah. frequently? How are we getting things out there? Like, are y'all still happy with WordPress? What, what features do you want? What, you know, how is that uh, for every one of our constituents, how are we being responsive to what they need in our endeavor to make our products both kind of more intuitive and easier to use and more powerful at the same time, which is hard to do, especially over the 19 years that WordPress has been around when the technology substrate has changed so much, yeah. you know, introduction of JavaScript, introduction of the iPhone, mobile platforms, everything has happened uh, since we started. And it's hard 19 years later, we're not just growing as fast as we used to, we're actually growing faster than we mm -hmm. used to. And that's because of that flywheel I talked about earlier, when open source, you, know, you get more users, you get more developers, the product gets better, then you get more users, you get more developers and the product gets better. Mm -hmm. so. And so how do you do the, the the part in there you mentioned that I f would think would be most difficult is like ensuring that you still have people who will be very honest and candid with their feedback and who will call you out when you're wrong. Like that is the thing that I think I see most often with people who achieve a, a fair amount of success and, and are in the top spot. Like they tend to be uh, insulated against that, right? Either by their own doings or by people around them because it serves them better to, to have that be that way. Right. So how do you actually practically go about doing that? Well, some of that was just luck. You know, I won the ovarian lottery <laughs> <laughs> Growing up, uh, with a pretty tight knit family, including two really strong Texas women <laughs> and my mom and sister. So just first and foremost, they keep me honest. I would say, you know, make friends with journalists. <laughs> I'm lucky to have had Ohm in my life since the very beginning. Um, you know, journalists will always call you out. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. yeah, we're known for that. I think just look for that. 
because it's not just having people that will call you out. It's like, what do you do? How do you respond when they do? Mm -hmm. Anyone who cares about you will want to see you um, do your best, whether that's, you know, a partner, a friend, a family member, anything. But it's like, what do you do when you get that feedback? Naturally, we're all going to be defensive. Like, yes. Oh, that's not me, or that's fine, or I didn't do that. But like, how can you really take that as regardless of whether you agree about it or not, but something that's coming from a place of care from that other person. And there's some wisdom in it, regardless of how um, the delivery mechanism is. I actually really appreciate our haters and trolls and people mm. who, who hate me, who hate WordPress, everything like that. Like, I try to read that and engage with it. Um, not because I always think it's right. Often I disagree with it, but I'm like, well, this person is passionate and there's some belief they have. How did they arrive to this? Mm -hmm. What was their experience? What was their kind of, if I were walking in their shoes, would I have ended up in the same place? Right. Because maybe, maybe their site got hacked and they couldn't fix it, or maybe something happened to them that uh, led them there. And so if you, if you really dig in, there's usually some real nugget of wisdom there. And, um, and yeah, and the good news is, like, if you don't do this, the market also wakes you up. <laughs> <'Cause> also, <laughs> like, if you don't do it, your competitors will. So <laughs> right. at some level, like, just a free and open market will be uh, keep everyone honest in the end. But you'd rather it's the uh, the former situation, probably, where you actually <laughs> realize yeah, well, it before yeah, the market yeah. does. But I think, I mean, I really think you mentioned, you know, the, the um, your, your luck in terms of family and just kind of like who you are. But, like, that is what... I, I don't know if this is true, but anecdotally, I've heard that you are, you know, just the most humble down to earth person and that you always have been. And that like, it, I, I remember stories, you know, this is a while ago now, but still you're very successful of like, oh, Matt Mellon will, will give you a ride. If you happen to be in town and like, you need a ride, he'll come and pick you up. And like, I think at the time they were like, you know, it's a terrible K car or something, but he'll come. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll and he'll give you a ride like have you maintained that has that helped or how do you do you do you have to make a conscious effort to do that i know this is going to make you very uncomfortable because i'm basically asking you to brag about your humility but <laughs> <laughs> uh you know honestly some of that probably happens a bit less i do have a lot more responsibilities on my time because mm -hmm. automatic now 2000 people even the wordpress community has grown so much that i do feel stretched thin a lot more than i used to be mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, just as you become more successful, sometimes you do get more folks coming after you, right. uh, that I more think folks wanting work. rides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so if there were someone listening to this, who were in the same situation, I would say the best hack for staying really connected is customer support. So mm -hmm. I just go in anonymously. It doesn't, well, sometimes I'll do it just when people reach out to me, like friends and family or people on Twitter, I'll just try to help them. But like, actually, if you can go into whatever your help desk is or live chat or something like that, just anonymously and start like helping some people that mm -hmm. use your product, gosh, <laughs> they'll be super <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> like whatever you think your problems are, you're going to learn a lot. I guess user test is another version of this. Like when you like do some sort of recording with real users, but yeah, I would say, you know, frontline customer support, customer service is um, one, one of the most important jobs in your company, because these are the people that are really the face of your company mm -hmm. to everyday users. And two, if you uh, if your company's gotten really big, you feel a little more disconnected from the community, the best way to reconnect. Okay. Yeah. That's part advice. of my culture. So everyone who joins automatic does two weeks of customer support to start. Nice. And then every single person in the company rotates back at least one week per year, uh, back into customer service. So we've tried to build it in just as a regular thing, um, to our culture. What's the vibe of that among employees? Are they like, I got to go back to customer support for a week? Or is that like a thing they look forward to, like flexing different muscles in their brain? Or like, do you, do you, is there like a general consensus or do people feel differently about it based on their job? I think it's a range. If I'm really, spectrum. I'm sure some people in automatic hate it and like wish we would get rid of it. Yeah. But <laughs> I think it's really important for those people too. And, um, the, in the beginning, the most common thing is people think they're not going to be able to do it. But our kind of secret hack is that doing the customer service is part of the onboarding and how we train you. Mm -hmm. So you're not just thrown into the deep end of the pool. Like you're actually paired with another what we call happiness engineer or customer support person, who, by the way, is really friendly and nice. And it's kind of like paired with you 
like teaching you in the teaching you how to answer the customer questions. They're also teaching you our internal systems, how our products work, you know, some of the automatic culture, everything. So it's a right. little bit of a sort of applied onboarding um, mm. that both c tries to instill that the customer is uh, the most important thing in the company, far more than your boss or anything like that, um, and kind of teaching you our systems at the same time. Yeah, I think, uh, Jordan, we should implement something like that, but I don't know. I don't know what does how that mean? it works. Just for us. sit on Twitter and just wait. Yeah, we would, we would, have, what we, comes. we should do a hotline for like complaints about TechCrunch and then people that just sounds great. man the phone or whatever for a little Maybe while. Responding and moderating the comments. You well, know, we don't, we don't, look we don't do that. comments <laughs> anymore. No, I mean, like everybody has their own Twitter, their Twitter auto publishes their story. That's and true. They we get attach it. the handle. It's right? live, so, it's yeah. happening all the time. Like we are customer support. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, you mentioned offhand just the, like, if, if there are any problems and, you know, like, cause we had, we had some times, right. And I think we, one of the transitions like to when, when mobile was really coming up and there were some, diff, there was a lot of challenges there where people are like, Oh, I really want to be able to get it on my phone. And the experience wasn't really one-to-one, -one. Mm -hmm. but honestly, like it's been so stable and I, it's really, that is the other thing that just is amazing about, kind of WordPress and what you've managed to accomplish is that you open it up and it still feels like a product of today, today, despite the fact that it's now, you know, 20 years old. But it also doesn't feel like it's changed that much either. That you feel like, lost. I am not. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Or it's like, oh, it looks and feels totally new, you right. know? And then you're like, wait, where's all of my shit? You know, okay. um, it does both at the same time, which is, I don't, pretty difficult. You know, I'm the kind that like throws a fit when there's yeah. an update if the button anything. is moved yeah i like, can't find the button no. yeah 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 it's i'll write like long diatribes on this on the website about it but to survive we have to move the button sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> that's true i really admire about think of the dominant platforms today of like android and ios um i think they have like a longer term vision at least in my head they have a longer term vision for where they want to go but they know that they're going to need to take people incrementally. So they do mm. a little bit of a each release each year. And um, we, we're trying to do the same thing that I think they're really good at, which is like we have a vision for where we need to go to be relevant five, 10 years from now. But we know that we're going to need to take you a version at a time there. So we'll just do a bit of it at the time. Um, because I agree, when you do that kind of like total redesign, everything's changed. You lose one of the most valuable assets any popular product has, which is like the knowledge of your user base, the familiarity of them with um, how to use it. So at that point, they're like, well, I have to learn something new. Maybe I should learn something brand new. Right, <laughs> exactly. Which now I'm annoyed at. Yeah. No, I think, I think maybe you're giving too much credit for some of the larger platforms, but I'm glad that you adopt that strategy. Like, let's get to the five years slowly. I think a lot of theirs are made more off the cuff. Their decisions, <laughs> no special knowledge of that. Um, we already asked about uh, uh, crypto, so I have to, I just, because I'm very curious about your thoughts on the metaverse, whether you think the metaverse is a real thing, will be a real thing, will people yeah. publish and create in the metaverse? I mean, it like is a real thing to some extent right now, right? Sure. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm very much in the like, it's really fun to play with, mm -hmm. you know, VR platforms are are really fun. Some of the games are awesome. I, I can't wear it for too long. Like the, the hardware is still, but you know, look back at the original iPhone. So if, if we can follow a similar curve there, um, perhaps it could be something that people could use more of the day or is like a more immersive experience. I know there's challenges right now around like certain refresh rates and things that like sometimes make people nauseous. So like, but let's not forget that screens are really beautiful and great too. <laughs> like there's yeah. something magical about this, like, it's kind of like a tricorder from Star Trek, right? Like we have this glass slab, which can transform into like anything, which is yeah, actually truly magical. It's a thing that we take for 100% granted today that if you went back 20 years, we'd be like, this is sci-fi. This is like 100 yes. years in the future. Like the ultra wide band, super fast wireless, always connected with Starlink, it's gonna be now on the entire globe. <laughs> like that yeah. is, that's wild. Yeah. Um, and so I do feel like uh, hopefully like VR and AR experiences can become something that we use more, but it's hard for me to imagine just from like a ergonomic point of view and like a, an integration with our lives point of view, 
that we're not still going to have screens or something like a screen for just the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nothing else. It's just nice not to have something on your head or face all the time. Yeah, for sure. That, that, I mean, I, I agree with you. Like I enjoy exploring it and, but I can only do like sort of very, very well, like sort of belt curtailed. buckle or like lapel pin holograms. Right. If there's something like that. Great. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. That's what <laughs> I'm working for it. on. All right. That's Jordan's startup. Um, if you yeah, I think invest into our biology, like if it gets <laughs> fully integrated, then they're like, I'm, yeah, I'll be the first to like, Oh really? It. You're volunteering. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's good yeah, info. It is good info, but we, we were talking, I was talking to a space founder about this yesterday, like the exact phenomenon you're describing, but on a, uh, to me, this was the most shocking scale was that we'll get pitches now pretty regularly from blue, uh, origin. And they'll be like, oh, we have another, you know, private space flight going up and, they'll say, okay, you know, they, there's five new private astronauts going up and we go, okay, who are they? And they're like, oh, it's this person. This, and we're like, I don't recognize any of those names. Maybe we'll get you next time. <laughs> it's like, wow. wait, did people going to space and a private tourism suddenly become like, like normal? Just like the, like, that's something you take for granted, just like your phone. Right. And just having that realization was my goodness, how quick we are to adapt to things like that. Right. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh well thanks very much matt i think we're out of time um but are you going to space anytime soon if you want to announce it here uh it. your biometric we'd cover that one we'd cover that one i promise that's exciting enough we would cover that that's something i don't want to be an early adopter of. <laughs> really <laughs> i'm like way more normal than now like let's go a few million of those and i would love to do it someday but i'm definitely not like lining up to be first not in either block. okay I know right. where, there, where there's too much pressure or lack of oxygen i'm just not interested so undersea either jordan doesn't no work. yeah i i actually am worse about undersea because at least when you go up to space you're like oh you can see the earth and all this stuff you go under the sea you're just seeing like monsters and shit like i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to do that okay well i can solve both your problems with an implant that provides you <laughs> A fully an immersive uh, experience, yeah, an immersive of those reality things. experience of those things where you're perfectly safe. So cool. we'll get right on that, and we'll have it for you next time you're on. Hopefully, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Quick development process. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>